Hello and welcome to everyone joining us today. My name is Brechna Aftab and I work for Haymarket Books. Before we begin, on behalf of Haymarket Books, I want to express our solidarity in absolute terms with those struggling in Jerusalem and all across Palestine today against the ongoing violence and brutality of Israeli settler colonialism. In light of cynical and distorted mainstream media coverage and reporting on Palestine, it is crucial that we platform voices against settler colonialism, against apartheid, and for a liberated Palestine. We're very grateful to our speakers for joining us today for this conversation. Sai and Tofik will be helping us make sense of recent tensions between uh, liberal and religious Zionists, and whether we are seeing changes in Palestinian resistance against Israel's colonial project. We will also hear from them on how we can understand recent developments in light of shifting global and regional geopolitical dynamics. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our two brilliant comrades, Sai Englert and Tofi Kadad. Sai Englert is a lecturer at Leiden University in the Netherlands. He works on settler colonialism, Zionism, labor movements, and anti-Semitism. He is a member of the editorial boards of Notes from Below and Historical Materialism. He is the author of Settler Colonialism, an Introduction. Tofi Kadad is a Palestinian academic and the author of Palestine limited neoliberalism and nationalism in the occupied territories. He currently directs the Council for British Research in the Levant's Kenyan Institute in East Jerusalem and has worked in various capacities across the occupied Palestinian territories as a journalist, researcher, consultant, editor and publisher. We'll also be taking questions from the audience so if you do have any questions please do feel free to share those in the chat. Sai and Tofik, thank you again. Handing over to you. Hi, folks. <laughs> I think I'm going to start this off. So I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Haymarket Books, and give a big uh, red salute to all the comrades out there uh, who I uh, may know or not. Uh, I did a book back in the day with Haymarket, so it's great to be back here and also to be speaking to this, uh, your audience, your wide audience. Uh, I'd also like to say that I'm obviously speaking today in the capacity as, uh, as an individual researcher and, and not for my organization, which is kind of important for me to say. Um, you know, events uh, in Israel-Palestine today are, are quickly escalating, as uh, folks may know. I'm not sure if folks have had the chance to actually see uh, the news today, but like 30 rockets from South Lebanon were fired into northern Israel today, uh, sort of posing one of the most sort of, you know, uh, b b very much speaking to the, the explosive potential of, of the situation, not just in Israel, Palestine, but regionally. And hopefully my comments can sort of uh, speak to where some of that is coming from. Uh, I've only, I've been told that I've been given 10 minutes to try and put this all into context, which is not very much time and it's very com complicated, but hopefully I'll be able to provide a decent uh, amount of background uh, to be able to understand sort of the large threads of what's going on and we can get into more detail once uh, once we're done speaking and you guys, uh, folks provide their, their questions. So I'm happy to field all that stuff. So uh, I guess the main thing that I want to sort of speak to today is probably sort of framing it in terms of all the dynamics that we're witnessing today largely uh, arise from the quote unquote success of Israel and the Western powers vis-a-vis uh, -vis what they thought was a great success in terms of their ability to contain, suppress, and kind of destroy the Palestine project slash question. Now, uh, sort of to understand that broad, like they are today essentially the victim of their successes, uh, which 
truth be told, were not successes at all, but actually kicked the uh, the main questions of the quote unquote conflict to other theaters, complexifying them, raising the stakes uh, much, much higher than they were, uh, and bring them to a level of what what could be a, a, a incredibly destructive regional war that might be on the horizon. And I think for that reason, it's important to sort of speak of the gravity of the situation today. What 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 happened in terms of the rockets being fired is 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 definitely only a, a small message that is being sent today between those actors, so to speak, uh, but is a harbinger of potentially much, much greater uh, destruction and uh, very dangerous situation. So I, I do want to impart that to the audience today that I think folks need to be paying attention to the situation very closely and re recognize the potential uh, dangers and dramatic nature of what, what what we're witnessing today. So to put all this in context, we really kind of need to roll the the roll the film back like 30 years to the Oslo process. So this this year, 2023 is 30 years to Oslo. Oslo was seen as this sort of uh, you know peace process that was uh, uh, marketed to the world where you know they had the Nobel Prize given to the people who signed it and all that stuff. Um, but fundamentally, what the Oslo pro because I don't have time to go into the Oslo pro uh, thing, and I imagine that a lot of you folks know know what the background to Oslo uh, was. But essentially, the Oslo process was basically a process whereby the two players, the PLO and Israel and the Western camp, putting them together as one, sort of find mutual interests at a particular historical moment. But fundamentally, Israel and the Western powers were the stronger party. And they basically, the US pushes Israel, encourages Israel to sort of take advantage of the historical weakness of the PLO to uh, a, essentially, Israel was facing this important dilemma and crisis in terms of the fact that uh, we had the first intifada from 1987 to around 1993. This posed a major contradiction for Israel in terms of it being able to manage the Palestinians in the occupied territories of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, in Gaza. And their solution for that, and that the, the main fact elements of that contradiction was the fact that Israel, as the Jewish democratic state, was basically controlling millions of Palestinians and it didn't want to give them citizenship because that would erode the quote Jewish character of the state. And they, uh, uh, if, if they gave them citizenship, if they deprived them from citizenship, it would mean that they would be the. Uh, it would erode the democratic character of the state. So the historical Israeli solution and American solution was basically to create a kind of autonomy scenario where Palestinians would have a form of self-governance, but this self-governance in the main concentrated cities of the Palestinian, of the OPT, would not be strong enough to form the basis of a Palestinian state, okay? And uh, and they, but at the same time, they needed a centralizing power to be able to manage and quote, govern these territories and, the, and, and this population because they were rising up and they were actually destroying the Israeli settlement project in the West Bank and Gaza. So the Americans said, get the PLO in town. They will be the main address. We will be able to contain them in these major Palestinian cities. And uh, by essentially controlling the commanding heights over, uh, the, and when I mean commanding heights, I mean the discursive heights, the actual physical heights, the, the, fact, the fact that to leave these cities, you, you needed to go through Israeli controlled. I mean, the entire area was Israeli controlled, but basically the Israelis needed to separate from the Palestinians and they needed to sort of contain them. And the Oslo Accords allowed for that containment process to take place and the establishment of an autonomy scenario where Israel could basically say, we're not responsible for these folks anymore, even though in truth, they were responsible for everything that entered and exited the area. They were responsible for the air, this, the water, the electricity, the, the, uh, the internet, the telephone lines, the skills, the people, the finance. So they had master control over the Palestinians, 
behind the illusion that uh, the Palestinians had some sort of state in the making. Of course, Israel and the West had no interest long term to kind of solve the major issues of the Israel-Palestine conflict. And we understand now today how this dynamic develops over 30 years to lead to the scenario today where basically human rights groups can only but confirm that essentially an apartheid state and infrastructure has been established. And that means both that there's different legal regimes that govern if you're Jewish or if you're Palestinian, Muslim or Christian or whatever, and uh, let alone the infrastructure side of the coin. To bear in mind that when Oslo happened, there was 150,000 uh, even less settlers in the West Bank. Today, there are more than 700,000 settlers in the West Bank, okay? So behind this illusion of the peace process, Israel is able to greatly strengthen the settlement project, win time to do that, win time to do build that infrastructure. And through the building of infrastructure that linked the settlement project and expanded it, it obviously broke up the, and fragmented the Palestinian project and contained, most importantly, the Palestinian national movement and leadership within these areas behind this very complicated discourse of security and peace. And if you were against it, you were sort of against peace. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that was one of the most important enduring elements of what came out of the Oslo process. So uh, Oslo process basically was aimed to solve the Jewish democratic contradiction or dilemma, so to speak and uh, particularly the crisis of the Intifada through this autonomy scenario. This process essentially resulted over the past 30 years in the globalization of Israel, and as well as its capital and security dimensions. This is important to understand because Israel was severely contained, like there were more international states internationally that recognized the PLO then recognized Israel. There was a secondary boycott against Israel. They couldn't get to India. They couldn't get to China. And Israeli capital was interested in globalizing only through the peace process. And this illusion of this sort of willingness to make peace was Israel able to reach beyond its traditional allies in, in, in the Western uh, hemisphere, to, so to speak. As I said as well, it contained the Palestinians in this very sort of dystopian situation where essentially Palestinians were locked in 10 different major clusters of little islands, all surrounded by settlements and Israeli military posts. But if you even break that down, 150 little islands and islets, islets, whatever, across the West Bank. And of course, Gaza was a whole nother story, let alone Jerusalem was broken off from the West Bank. Uh, so Gaza actually functionally becomes the largest island in the, the Palestine archipelago of Israel-Palestine apartheid today, okay? Uh, another uh, important uh, dimension of what, what took place over the past 30 years was there was this a major intervention of the international powers. They were the ones who laundered the whole, whole agreement and process, and they funded it. In fact, they funded... 30, 35 billion dollars of Western taxpayer money came in to fund this arrangement, to fund the infrastructure of apartheid, to fund the startup of the Palestinian Authority. And of course, a key dimension of the Palestinian Authority was providing jobs, many of which were security force jobs, but also the jobs of governance and quote unquote civil administration, an administration that really didn't have that much power. It always had to go beyond ask the Israelis or the Americans, give us money, give us, allow us to do this, build that, whatnot. And every, at every turn, this provided the Israelis and the Americans an opportunity to basically blackmail the Palestinians. Okay, now the point here though, is this major international intervention, which also included the establishment of different international bodies and the direct intervention of people like the World Bank and the IMF in an advising capacity of the, over the whole situation led to the creation of an infrastructure that I would argue was not designed for conflict resolution, of course, but was designed for conflict management in a broader mentality that we need to contain and control this conflict because it's so explosive and so um, it, it leads to, you know, exploding and pissing off all these Arabs and Muslims that we need to sort of have those structures in place to be able to contain it when it explodes. 
of course, I'm not speaking about longer term interests of what the Western Imperial Project or Israel's longer term interests, because I would also basically say even this arrangement, the Oslo apartheid arrangement that emerged today, which wasn't entirely like teleologically determined, but and obviously evolves over time and through the resistance of Palestinians didn't look exactly the way they wanted it to. But the point was, um, uh, because uh, including the fact that Israel maintain this, I believe, is basically a longer was seen as a temporary solution to Israel's pr problem, uh, pr pr problems and dilemma. Uh, in prepar to, to basically, it was what was possible in in light of the 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 balance of power, so to speak. But Israel never could accept a Palestinian state or even uh, if the demographics of the situation got to such a level where Palestinians were a majority throughout the whole of OPT. You know, not just OPT, excuse me, historical Palestine between the river and the sea. And mind you, we're basically around 50-50 in terms of the amount of Jews and the amount of Palestinians between the river and the sea, uh, okay? So we're, we're at a kind of important historical turning point, and for that reason, that it's not just about containing the Palestinian issue, but that this is, we also begin to hear more talk amongst the Israelis about we need to take more dramatic steps, whether it's in terms of more violence to actually crush Palestinian resistance, or if we need to open up these questions, we're willing to talk about another new forms of transfer. But in any case, um, of course, establishing this whole framework was only possible through establishment of apartheid and lots and lots of bloodshed uh, on, on the Palestinian side. And also a fair amount of Israelis were killed in the process too, because Palestinians did not go down quietly. Now, uh, part of the ironies of the situation today, through the, in, insofar as this great infrastructure of conflict management as a temporary solution uh, was established and Israel was sort of basically freed to expand its settlement project and, and globalize and do what it did. A an irony of the situation was that it animated and strengthened further national religious sentiment that was incipient within the Zionist project to begin with, because what in the end is the Jewish national project and the creation of Israel to begin with. Uh, and uh, it it also led to the, to some extent, the cashing out of the traditional Ashkenazi elite within Israel. Uh, when I mean cashing out is basically they were the main benefactors of the globalization process that Israel went through. And th they are already the cultural and political and economic elites of Israel the, that benefited from this Oslo victory slash success. Now, the animation of the national religious dynamic and the giving of uh, uh, tailwinds to it has, a, in addition to the demographic dynamics within Israel uh, uh, and the the end of Israel, the, the traditional pragmatic labor Zionist historical role to establish the state was seen as basically over and, and, and or, or had, had completed its historical role. So what we see today, after a period of instability of five different Israeli election cycles, is eventually this slow transition where the old powers that established the state and which were traditionally historically hegemonic within Israel, today sort of like ha happy, sitting pretty, well, uh, you know, do, do, doing economically well. Many of them also have Western passports. Whereas the second Israel, the, and, and I, I don't say that by my, they were all, within Zionist discourse, there was always the beautiful Israel and then the second Israel. The second Israel was the religious, uh, the Orthodox communities, the Arab Jews, those who didn't fit the traditional sort of Ashkenazi new Jew model that Zionism was purporting to be creating here. So eventually what we see is these different social constituencies that were, that were, were part of the Zionist project, uh, and we're not, but we're not its initiators, eventually get to a stage where an alliance is formed between the national religious, 
the Orthodox communities and the Arab Jews, largely speaking, arriving at demographic majority status in the context of the fragmentation of the opposition and, uh, and essentially their capture of the state, okay? And that capture of the state has is seen by them as a historical opportunity for them to finally realize their ambitions and interests vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, but also their gripes vis-a-vis -vis the Ashkenazi elite that used to, that, that, that had marginalized them, that was eating off, e eating the lion's share of the pie previously. I won't go more into that dynamic. I'll let Sai probably talk more about it, and I probably said too much already. However, um, I just, uh, on the Palestinian side, allow me to wrap up on the Palestinian side, what we, this dynamic led to, of course, the containment of the Palestinian leadership and national project in this dystopian structure called the Palestinian Authority, which is a, a state in the making, but it never is able to realize itself in any way because it has no power and me no means of lifting itself up from its structural containment and dependency within this apartheid framework. It also led, of course, to the fragmentation of OPT and whatnot. Uh, 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 it also led to the containment of the party structure that were traditionally the civil society elements that had engaged in kind of representation and service provision for Palestinians, okay? So uh, 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 their containment, like their organizations get locked in either their they're completely outside because they're branded as terrorists or they're locked in sort of NGO-like structures dependent upon Western funding and, and, and are locked in their wars of position with, with Israel, uh, but are, are not able to take more frontal uh, positions of defense against an average Palestinian in the OPT. Okay, this has led to basically large localization of the conflict in the individual little islands. Okay, and we see that in the explosion of Gaza once in a while, and now we see it in the West Bank because basically the battle today is not for Gaza. The battle today is for the areas outside of the area A in the West Bank that the settlers are basically encroaching on. So we see today the emergence of new localized political uh, movements and organizations outside the traditional party structure, outside the Palestinian Authority, attempting to defend Palestinian interests and further them through by initiating, uh, by, by, by attempting to by attempting to resist and target Israeli targets, be they the army or settlers in these areas. And so that's why we see these dynamics in Nablus and Jenin, by the way, with Nablus and Jenin being not only Jenin being the poorest area, but also large areas of land where the settlements are actually really trying to push forward and encircle things, uh, encircle these areas. Um, so, and then the final dynamic of this that I want to say is Jerusalem, where I am today, because Jerusalem was outside of this whole equation. Israel would never give up anything in East Jerusalem and wants to eternally control it at it forever, uh, of course. And it so for that reason, the direct occupation and brutality of military governance over population in Jerusalem, particularly where all the holy sites are, in a context where you have this national religious zeitgeist and, you, you know, ultra uh, messianic, you know, which believes it can realize its historical mission to finally erect the third temple. I mean, all, all yesterday they were arresting basically settlers in the old city who wanted to slaughter a, a goat on the, on the temple mount. I mean, this is what we're, this is the Israeli Jewish democracy today. That's what it's all about, like slaughtering a, a goat on, on, on the quote unquote temple mount. So, uh, but ironically, Jerusalem is, of course, you know, the, it's, it's, it's the key to the whole thing because it doesn't just relate to Palestinians. It relates to 1.5 billion Muslims, okay, and another 400,000, 400 million uh, Arabs. So who are all in the area, who are all fasting right now in the middle of Ramadan. And uh, it, it ironically becomes one of, it's not ironic, but it's, it's, it becomes logically 
the 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 live wire where this thing can explode because basically it, 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 it's the front line. It's the I don't know if the third rail is the quite quite accurate way to say it. So essentially, these rockets were fired today because two days ago they went in to Al Aqsa at four in the morning and tried to kick out and arrested 400 worshipers who were there and beat everybody up in the middle of, you know, the, the, the third most important mosque in, in, in all of Islam. So, and it's a very sensitive issue. So that's where we stand today. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Long. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tofik. Um, I'll 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 pick it up from here, and then the idea is also a bit that we that we we discuss um, a, a little bit further. So you'll still have the opportunity to come back to things, and I think maybe it'll be useful for both of us to then reflect on maybe how some of these kind of local processes relate to kind of larger regional and and international ones. Um, I wanted to start the 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 task I was given was to kind of shed some light on the the current um political crisis in israel uh and to kind of connect it i think to to a lot of what tofik has has very helpfully kind of outlined so in a nutshell i i assume people will have will have followed it but uh, since the beginning of the year we've seen the kind of acceleration of two processes that are playing uh, uh themselves out at the same time which is on the one hand uh, and Tofik has spoken about it, the kind of unleashing of uh, much more rapid and intense uh, violence against the Palestinians, um, both uh, militarily uh, and through uh, the kind of growth of confidence of, of the settler movement, which uh, was perhaps captured the kind of most powerfully uh, in the uh, the images that people will have seen uh, of the pogrom in Huara, where you see sort of hundreds of settlers uh, descending uh, on a on a Palestinian town and attacking Palestinians, breaking property, etc., and that really captures, I think, this this acceleration uh, of an ongoing and existing violence uh, in the in the occupied territories um, that that we've witnessed over the the, the last uh, few months. Um, uh, in since the beginning of the year alone, Israel has killed over eighty Palestinians, um, uh, and and points to the fact that this year. Uh, will already be much more uh, uh, sort of murderous than than the preceding ones, uh, which certainly uh, weren't um, uh, you know uh, peaceful uh, or, or, or um, uh, yeah peaceful. At the same time, what we've seen is this kind of explosion of massive demonstrations, um, road occupations, uh, strikes. Although I'll say something about that uh, in in a moment within Israeli society itself. Um, and uh, both of these processes of kind of increased tension have as their uh, immediate kind of starting point, although as Tofik has already pointed to, they're part of much longer processes and developments. Uh, the election of uh, the kind of latest Israeli government led by Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, the alliance of the most uh, conservative right-wing uh, uh, elements uh, inside of Israeli society that he could put together to build a, a majority. And so that goes from uh, the kind of ultra-Orthodox uh, parties all the way to the most accelerationist elements uh, of the, the, the settler movement uh, in the West Bank, including uh, settlers uh, in his uh, uh, government, not that that's necessarily new. What is new is that that includes um, uh, open followers uh, of uh, the Kahanist movement, which is, uh, a, you know, uh, very open and aggressive about its uh, uh, sort of eliminationist calls uh, uh, towards the Palestinians. Um, ministers who celebrated uh, Baruch Goldstein, who um, uh, uh, committed the the massacre uh, in the in the mosque in Hebron in the late 1990s, etc., who kind of openly celebrate these sort of uh, these sort of um, uh, uh, actors. Uh, and in fact, the finance minister, who is is one of these uh, settlers, has been put in charge of the West Bank, and so it's also the first time that a civilian. Uh, politician uh, is uh, the the Israeli head, let's say, of the occupied territories rather than a, a, a military uh, 
uh, uh, person uh, in response to Huara. Um, he was uh, asked, uh, Smotrich, the, the politician, was asked um, uh, to react to it. And uh, his response was to say that he thought Huara needed to be wiped off the map. So it, it gives an idea uh, and that the Israeli state should do it. So it gives an idea of the kind of uh, people uh, that are in play and why they would give much greater confidence to both the military and the settler movement in the West Bank. Uh, to carry out uh, 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 an increased kind of uh, level le level of violence and assault against the Palestinians. At the same time, there is this real kind of social tension play itself out in Israel, and that is both in response to an immediate question, which is the fact that this government by Netanyahu is trying to use its majority to redraw uh, lines inside of uh, the Israeli state and largely by taking on uh, the high court, which the Israeli right and the, the religious right sees as uh, a sort of uh, liberal body that uh, repeatedly stops it from doing uh, what it wants. Um, we should immediately bracket that and we can perhaps say more about that uh, later. It is that same high court that legalizes uh, settlements that are uh, considered legal by no other body uh, in the world uh, except itself. Um, and uh, that uh, has facilitated the kind of expansion uh, of Israeli colonialism over a very long time and given it a kind of a veneer uh, of, uh, of, of uh, legal and, and democratic rights uh, where, it, where it has none. But nonetheless, it puts some limits on that process, uh, which, which the, the Israeli right um, uh, sees as, as in, uh, unacceptable. Uh, and so a series of kind of legal changes are, are being rushed through or were being rushed through uh, the Israeli parliament in an attempt at allowing the parliament to override the decisions of the high court, as well as to strengthen the role of the government in selecting future uh, uh, appointees. There are a number of other laws that are also being passed. Perhaps the most important one is one that has given the, the Knesset majority and therefore the government the ability to uh, uh, limit massively um, the High Court's uh, possibility of uh, declaring a prime minister unfit uh, to rule. And that's uh, really a sort of immediate self-serving decision for Netanyahu, who is sitting trial uh, for, for uh, charges of, um, um, what do you call it? Um, accepting money in official positions, the word escapes me, um, uh, and, and so could be challenged by the High Court uh, uh, in a way, bribery, uh, uh, in, in, and could be challenged by the High Court, and so kind of also laws uh, of kind of immediate self-preservation. And this has triggered a massive immediate kind of confrontation in Israeli society in which the long-term conflict that Tofik talked about is playing itself out once again in Israeli society, which is this conflict between an old Zionist elite organized around the Labour Party and its institutions that sees itself as liberal, democratic, part of the European world, etc., and that sort of defends its uh, colonial process and the expulsion of Palestinians in a mix of a sort of a civilizing mission uh, language and uh, the need to defend itself. And that elite is seeing itself replaced. And really, that's a process that's been going since the late 1970s, but that has accelerated majorly over the last two decades by a new alliance between, on the one hand, an internationalized Israeli capital. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And so it's one of the ways in which I think it links to the kind of normalization deals we've seen, etc. It's a, it's a uh, a very also U.S. kind of centered uh, Israeli capital with a hyper-religious settler movement that, do is do that is doing the colonial work. And that alliance that kind of was forged in the 1970s is really the only internally coherent political force inside of Israeli society. And so the social movements we're seeing for the moment is the alliance of everybody else that sees the kind of decisions being taken as a way for that bloc to lay a much more fundamental claim on the Israeli state, and I think rightly so. And so much more than what the movement has sort of called its defense of democracy, I think what we're seeing is an attempt by that very broad alliance that goes all the way from the Israeli trade unions and the kind of old leftovers of uh, the, um, uh, the, the labor Zionist uh, uh, movement, 
uh, to very much the center and the right of Israeli society, uh, including elements of uh, the, the, the settler movement, which ruled uh, in, in a coalition uh, until the last election. Um, and people like Benny Gantz, who's very quickly becoming the kind of central figure of this movement, who is certainly not somebody that can be described as a, 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 a you know, even within the Zionist movement as, as, as within its left, famously celebrated his role in the 2014 attack on, on Gaza and the fact that he was, uh, he participated in bombing parts of Gaza back to the Stone Age in his own words, which he then used to uh, uh, get uh, get himself uh, elected. So saw it as a, as a mark of pride. So a very broad kind of alliance that has one thing in common, uh, which is in opposition to the kind of alliance between um, uh, Netanyahu and this and this kind of uh, uh, more broad uh, right, and opposes their attempt to lay a much more fundamental and long-lasting claim on the institutions of the state, including uh, including the the um, uh, the uh, the judiciary. What both sides of this divide have absolutely in common, however, is a deep commitment to the Zionist movement uh, and to its colonial project in Palestine. And I just think it's important to say that uh, when we when we discuss the movement is that we're not seeing a sort of a progressive left opposing uh, a dangerous right. We are seeing two sides of a colonial project confronting each other over who controls the state. A very powerful image of that is that when Palestinians have tried to participate in the movement, most of them haven't, and for very good reasons. They are confronted with both sides of their oppressors, those who have often for kind of ideological reasons, for example, because they are members of the Communist Party, uh, have found themselves excluded, uh, attacked for raising Palestinian flags, uh, censured when they've tried to speak on demonstrations, and it's been very clear that the question of uh, Israel's colonial process uh, 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 is not to be questioned or to be linked to the rollback uh, of, of civil liberties. One might ask if you live in a state that denies the civil liberties uh, of 50% of the people that live under its rule, whether it should be surprising that that process generalizes itself, but that is not a question that those social movements uh, are, are, are prepared, uh, are prepared to, to uh, ask themselves. I think part of the kind of confidence that the Netanyahu government has, has and is showing comes from um, the regional changes that we've seen over the last few years as well. And I think Tofik and I will perhaps speak about that a, a, a little bit more before we, we open uh, to the floor. But I think the fact that Israel was able to sign a, a new round of normalization deals, and again, that's a long-term process that starts in the late 1970s, first with a peace treaty with Egypt, then with Jordan, a closer and closer collaboration with Gulf states, and which is sort of uh, officialized uh, in uh, uh, in the, the so-called Abraham Accords uh, in, in 2020, um, in which the kind of direct diplomatic, economic, uh, and, and political connections with largely the Gulf, uh, as well as Morocco, um, uh, is becoming more officialized, and so that these states are also prepared to distance themselves more and more even of their rhetorical support uh, for um, Palestinian liberation, which was only that, rhetorical, but even that can sort of increasingly be abandoned, um, that that gives a much greater confidence as well uh, to Israel to start pushing on some of the, the, the things that had been considered red lines uh, in the aftermath of Oslo, and that clearly the settler movement is is trying to redefine for the moment uh, and to and to lay claims on kind of greater uh, areas uh, of Palestinian uh, uh, land that had been considered sort of uh, out of uh, out of reach, uh, which I which I I think very much um, uh, the, the the two should should sort of be be connected. I just wanted to end maybe on saying where is this going to go. People will have seen that. Uh, um, I, I'm a little bit confused about time. Now, I think it was last week, maybe it was two weeks ago. Uh, Israel, uh, um, Netanyahu sacked his, uh, well, said he was sacking. It's still not clear whether it's going to happen. Said he was going to sack his um, uh, defense minister 
uh, after he had called on Netanyahu to stop the, the judicial reforms. And this triggered an acceleration of the, the kind of demonstrations and, and occupations and, and strikes that we'd seen before. And so you had massive demonstrations in both the Histadrut, which is Israel's trade union federation, uh, and a historic institution of the Zionist movement, alongside with uh, employers' um, uh, organizations, announcing that they were shutting down the Israeli economy for a day. So the airport, uh, Haifa port, um, supermarkets, uh, schools, universities, etc., were on a mixture between strikes in some industries and actually employer lockouts in the others, because it's employers who sort of decided to, to shut it down. Uh, alongside a very large kind of demonstrations, forced the Netanyahu government to announce that they would pause uh, the reforms. They're very much paused, nothing has been pulled, uh, and they are to be rediscussed uh, after the, the parliamentary break that Israel is going in now. It seems that what will happen is that, on the one hand, Netanyahu will keep his coalition together long enough to pass their um, uh, their budget, uh, which will allow the coalition to sort of stabilize its its rule uh, uh, for the next two years, uh, which they'll do, uh, I think, if memory serves, in early June, after which um, the, the debate will restart uh, over these reforms. And I think there's very little reason to think that although there might be some changes, fundamentally, any of the, the, the packages uh, will be will be different. I think one intervening question is now how the Israeli government is going to react um, to uh, the, the developments that Tofik started with, uh, which are the responses both from Gaza and from uh, Lebanon uh, to the assaults on uh, uh, on uh, Al-Aqsa, as well as I think uh, in terms of the Lebanese response, the, the increased military assaults of Israel in uh, Syrian uh, 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 in Syrian territory uh, on Iranian. Uh, uh, targets. Um, nothing unites Israel, the Israeli public uh, like uh, a good uh, military confrontation. And I certainly don't think we should uh, write off the fact that uh, the Netanyahu government could see a real uh, interest or advantage uh, in responding extremely aggressively to the kind of uh, 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 developments that we are seeing now. I think it's also not for nothing that they're allowing the kind of uh, um, uh, challenges or provocations to take place uh, inside of uh, uh, inside of uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, and Al-Aqsa. I think either way, this spells nothing good for Palestinians, um, and and will certainly mean uh, more assaults, more violence, uh, more displacement, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and that raises an immediate question, I think, also for us in this national solidarity movement in terms of how we will respond. Um, uh, in terms of putting pressure uh, internationally on our own governments to put pressure on, on Israel uh, and rein it in at a time where clearly it's feeling uh, absolutely uh, free of kind of international pressure and totally um, in, in total impunity in terms of kind of meeting out its colonial violence against, against Palestinians. So I think that's something to bear in mind also in the discussion we'll have. Um, in, in terms of, of moving on, Tofik, I don't know if there's things that you wanted to react to in terms of, of what I said, and, and then also perhaps in terms of moving us to the next bit, uh, whether there's things you'd want to say in terms of the sort of the international picture also of how this fits into the regional and global transformations that, that, we're, that we're dealing with. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Sai. Uh, I had a couple uh, of things that I wanted to say here. Uh, just that might help fill out some of the pictures on on, on different frontiers. So uh, one thing I want to mention that I'm not sure if it really relates directly to what you were saying or not, but it's probably helpful for the audience to be aware of that this sort of second Israel, this uh, the non-beautiful Israel, <laughs> so to speak, um, is more linked to the settlement project, not just ideologically, but also like in its daily life. I don't know if folks remember around a dozen, maybe a 10 years ago, they were, it is very, very expensive around here. Tel Aviv was actually like last year or the year before the most expensive city in the world. OK, so uh, if you are from a quote unquote weaker or more a poorer section of Israeli society, the settlements are actually a, a 
you know, it's subsidized housing because they want to encourage people to go live in these houses that are in the middle of the West Bank. But that means, so these poor sections of Israeli society are like, you know, as I said, 100 and. 20,000 in 1993, today it's 700, 750,000. A lot, the demographics of that are not like your Ashkenazi, uh, you know, uh, uh, prosperous, uh, not all Ashkenazi are prosperous, but like the, fa the fact of the matter is obviously that would be disproportionately the second Israel who was, who is in who is forced to live in the settlement forced to live in the settlements bear in mind that about two-thirds of the settlers are actually just people who want cheaper housing it's only a third of the movement that's considered more harder ideological but of course with the harder ideology in addition to the fact that you know because they're living in a settlement and they have to go through checkpoints and palestinians may be throwing rocks at them or shooting at them or whatnot you know uh, you have this sort of storm of you know uh, these sections basically seeing their interest and their lot behind this coalition that took over power. Okay, so that's just one side that's, that might be just helpful to be, to say. A second point I wanted to say is around the issue of Kahana. Okay, I'm not sure, folks. You know, Sai mentioned it, but it's it's really important. Before in the past, there was no uh, the, Kahana is banned as a as, as a political party in Israel. Now, why is Kahana banned in Israel? Is it because there's such a bunch of fascists? Well, yes, there are a bunch of fascists, but what differs Kahana? What, 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 why is the Kahana different from, let's say, there's a whole party in Israel that used to be called the transfer party. So it's like totally legitimate to organize your entire party around ethnic cleansing in Israel, as long as the ethnic cleansing is Palestinian. So, and, and you know, that was a functioning party in the Israeli Knesset. You know, it was a right-wing party, okay, it was marginal to some extent, but like it was legitimate to be in parliament. What made Kahanism dangerous to the extent that the Israeli establishment needed to make them illegal in, in, in their participation in the Israeli political structure illegal was that they saw secular Jews as more dangerous than just the Arabs and the Muslims or the Palestinians, so to speak. Why? Because secular Jews, the logic of Jewish, uh, secular Jews is that Jews become like everyone else. And that can't be acceptable in their, that's a big deviation and, and you know goes totally against the idea of the chosen people and whatnot. The idea of equality. Now, I mean, it sounds a bit crazy for me to be saying this, and, but, but, but that is actually what they think. And it's not just what they think, it's what they do. They were banned because they started to attack secular Israelis, particularly those who were engaged in solidarity practices with Palestinians in the 80s, okay? It wasn't just that they were killing and massacre Palestinians when, if they had a chance, it's that they were attacking Israeli Jews, okay? So uh, that's a really important dimension. But this guy is the minister of security today, okay? <laughs> so it's not like when, when settlers are conducting a pogrom wherever, if you're a Palestinian, who do you call? You can't call the Palestinian Authority. It's like there's a, it, they wouldn't have been here. If it, they wouldn't dare to do it in a Palestinian Authority area, the settlers, they're, they're scared. You, if you try to call the Israeli police, it's his people who are conducting the pogrom. So you understand how dramatic and dangerous it is. And by the way, Ben Gvir, this minister of security, not only is he forming militias, his the only reason he didn't pull out of the Israeli government when Netanyahu said, okay, we'll freeze the judicial reforms, is he said, okay, he got guarantees that he was able now to form militias. So legitimate militias, which is a very dangerous dynamic because he very much understands that the fight in the end will be on the ground. It's going to be us or them and, 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 and that kind of logic. Bear in mind, this minister of security or whatever he is, is was not even allowed to be in the Israeli army because he had, uh, uh, what's it called? Now I'm losing my number, my, my words, because he had terrorism convictions. He had terrorism convictions and he's been arraigned more than 50 times for for the different sort of 
thuggish things that he's done against Palestinians, but also against, quote unquote, secular Israelis. OK, so bear that in mind. Third point to point out around the Arab world and the normalization deals. OK, here it's important to bring into the picture, of course, the Arab Spring, quote unquote, Spring or Arab revolutionary process that started in 2011. And of course, the disaster of American imperial designs and interests in the Middle East and greater Middle East. Of course, uh, the disaster of Afghanistan, Iraq, billions of dollars based in Afghanistan. They empowered the Taliban and now they had to recognize the Taliban basically and in a great defeat. And in Iraq, not only got rid of a contained Saddam Hussein and, uh, and all that stuff, but basically gave over Iraq to Iran, <laughs> like their, their biggest enemy. So basically Iran was able to have territorial, you know, realize much more broader territorial uh, projection of power. OK. And so in a context where the Americans could not be now, today, in 2023, go into a particular country and take out a government or, or take out a particular, I mean, maybe they might, but the, but, but the point is the crisis, people speak very openly about the fact that, uh, uh, well, firstly, the Arab, the reactionary Arab regimes, you know, the, particularly the monarchies of the Gulf, they were horrified that basically Obama didn't stop the Arab revolutionary process that was going on and basically allowed for these demonstrations to take place. And these guys who are highly dependent upon American power, basically they needed a big brother to be to, to play their game, to have their back. And their big brother is their, the regional ally is Israel who, who can play that game, okay? So the Americans in the crisis of their imperial project in the Middle East after Afghanistan and Iraq, kind of are encouraging their collection of allies, the Gulf states and wh whoever, wh who, you know, to kind of ally themselves with the Israelis to make a group, group you guys together and, and, and we'll, be, we'll help you contain the Iranian threat and the democratic threat, so to speak. So that also is an important part of the background. The final thing that I think needs to be said in this whole conversation is the crisis right now between the United States and Israel, okay? It's not by, a, I mean, of course, in broad terms, there's a large alliance between the United States and Israel and America's support of Israel is not contingent upon a particular government. You're talking about maybe upwards of 300 billions of dollar, billion, billion of dollars have been given to Israel to, by the United States since 1967. You know, you know, if it's the aircraft carrier that can't be sunk, et cetera. All of a sudden, you've got this government coalition that's in power that, okay, firstly, Biden was the VP under Obama who had his who Obama wanted to reinstitutionalize this sort of liberal internationalist American imperial project, right? After the catastrophe of Iraq and, and Bushism, okay? Trump goes the other direction. Now B Biden is back in power, but Netanyahu has gone the, is back in power in, in Israel as well. So there is a problem here, okay? Uh, and Biden is not a fool. He's a, like an old school, you know, whether you're a Cold War international liberalist or liberal internationalist imperialist. Uh, and he doesn't like the Netanyahu coalition. And there's reports from the Israeli press that like he tried to get rid of Netanyahu twice because he doesn't. The Zionist nationalist religious project is not the, Isra the, the um, U.S. imperial project. And if you remember two years ago from here in Sheikh Jarrah, basically when the last time the, the things kicked off, basically the Biden administration came in and shut it down and was like, stop it. We are not here to defend ad infinitum your messianic religious nationalist vision, which means that we have to defend every, every settler who wants to kick out every Palestinian out of every house based on fake property claims. We're not here to do that. We're here to support Israel as a secure Jewish state and part of the Western Hemisphere together with its allies in the region. And that's how they want to keep the architecture of U.S. influence and hegemony over the region. Because 
especially after the Arab Spring and, and all the historical dynamics, they can't keep everything down. It's not it's like whack-a-mole for, for them. And it's and the Arab world is getting getting stronger in its kind of the democratic impulses are, are coming out and there's large historical political economic factors that are that are making this whole situation explosive and it means their imperial project is threatened from from it so somebody like netanyahu and the bunch of folks behind him are a threat to america's America's larger interest in the region because it doesn't align within the balance of powers of how America has been organizing the thing so far, uh, and it's and it's problematic. But we don't know where that's going to go. In fact, something very interesting, the real significant thing, what caused Netanyahu? It wasn't just the general strike that the Israelis had, but uh, that that the, the 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 oppositionists in the Israeli camp had. It was the fact that the Israeli army began to show serious divisions, okay? And this is the key, po- America has been sponsoring this, this, this army for, to be the dominant army in the Middle East, their play, the, the aircraft carrier in the Middle East. And basically the elements of the, the uh, every section of the Israeli army, you were seeing divisions, including amongst the the fighter, the the. In fact, you didn't actually see divisions with the, the most. W- w- why is Israel so uh, so dominant military? Not just because they have a bunch of Western arms, but the fact is they have aerial superiority. Okay, even when the Americans sell F-35s to the Emirates, they make sure that the technology on it is a little less good than what they give to the Israelis. It's called what do they call it? They call it this dominant strategic. There's a there's an abbreviation for it. Maybe Sai can help me out with that. Any case, uh, they need to make sure that even even with U.S. allies, the U.S. allies don't have as good technology as the Israelis do. So the fighter pilot class in Israel basically said we're not going to. It was almost unanimous because they come from the Ashkenazi elite. They go. They are they are brought up through the system. And they are the ones who are given the keys to these F-35s. And they didn't really have anything. They don't really see that second Israel as something that's part of them. And you see very clearly these, this division is very strong. So these elite elite fighter pilots are like, we don't, you know, we don't want to be run by a dictatorship of Netanyahu and the right wing and blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's a problem for American imperialism because it means the main thing that they've been sponsoring, the reliable, strong army, might not be an army anymore. It could lead to potential civil. It, it might not be able to act if if it needs to act. It might fight each other, and worse yet, it actually might lead to out migration from Israel. And that is actually the likely scenario that we are willing to, about to see amongst Israeli society. I'll tell you a personal story of a friend who came to me to do a journalistic piece. She was from Portugal. She went to the Israeli journalist society here to get her journalist credentials, okay? The guy, of course, every journalist who comes to Israel who isn't backed by, a, you know, it doesn't come from like a major media organization or whatever that, that gets the automatic pass. They, it's kind of like their little censorship thing, right? Where like, do you, what kind of things do you write? What do you, you know, it's their way to vet people and to make them feel like, you know, it's their soft censorship uh, control of all that kind of stuff. Okay. So she gets called into the room with the head of the journalist association who who holds the key whether she can actually get a journalist uh, pass or not. The guy doesn't want to talk to her about what she wrote years ago about human rights or Palestinians or batik. He wants to ask where is the best place to buy property in Portugal? Because the <laughs> because all those guys who sit at the tops of those things are actually are are thinking you about using their Western passports and having a backup plan. So Israel, the U.S. is now trying to find a way to solve this thing, and it's not really sure how it's going to play out. Right now, it's just been stalled. So I'll leave it there. Sorry, that was a lot of back feedback commentary. 
Thanks so much, Tofik. I, I think we, we're going to want to move to to questions uh, quite quickly. I mean, just to add to that, I think I I, I agree really with 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 what you're saying. I think, you know, undoubtedly the um, uh, the the kind of mobilization of the elite in the army, and again, the kind of the division that you sh you talk about between the kind of the beautiful Israel and 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 the, the second Israel plays itself out in the army and so it's the kind of the most elite uh, uh, sections of the army uh, uh, joining um, there is a kind of a striking reality of course that the the planes continue to be able to strike uh, Syria on a kind of regular uh, uh, on a on a regular and kind of increasing speed so that also there's Sometimes I think perhaps a danger to to sort of overestimate the certainly the immediate kind of crisis that they that they might that they might uh, be facing. The the only thing I wanted to add before we open up is I think the the tension with the U.S. runs both ways, and so that you know what's happening in the region in general and in the kind of growing confidence I think of the of the Israeli state's assault on Palestinians is also the broad kind of transformation of the U.S.'s main focus, U.S. imperialism's main focus towards the, the Pacific, towards China, towards containment uh, uh, there, and that increases its dependence on its kind of allies in the region. And so the normalization deals are, are partly that, they're partly an internal process, but they're of course an external process that's encouraged very much by the American state to get its closest allies to um, uh, you know, uh, run the region for it, uh, let's say, but that also increases the kind of independence and the autonomy that these actors have uh, in lots of ways. And so on the one hand, they start making deals with people that perhaps they shouldn't be making deals with, uh, right? So you start seeing kind of close allies making deals with the Chinese or the Russians, etc., at the time of heightened crisis. But I also think it means that the US has uh, lessened, and I mean lessened and not that it has lost that ability, but it lessened the ability to keep its allies on the leash. Um, and so, you know, that you can see that with the Saudis, uh, whether they kill journalists in other people's capitals or whether uh, they make decisions on cutting the amount of oil uh, that gets released against the kind of di direct demands uh, of Washington. But I think also with Israel, that Israel feels a much greater ability to, to act um, independently or in direct kind of opposition to the to the demands of Washington, and that there is a diminished ability of Washington to immediately call back uh, its allies and and to demand that they they fall into line. And that's I think a dangerous I think it's a dangerous situation uh, to be in because there is an alignment of a number of uh, 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 of kind of internal and external processes that I think are really kind of uh, un um, restraining the kind of the worst elements of, of the Israeli colonial uh, colonial project. And then the other thing is that Israel is obviously important in lots of different ways, you know, in trade, etc. But one striking example is this setting up of the new, what is it, uh, 2I, 2U or 2U, 2I or the, the, the forum between Israel, India, the UAE uh, and the US. Uh, that signed these kind of large agreements to respond to the Ukraine war as well. And so to use the corridor between India, the UAE and Israel um, to have a sort of an exchange between agricultural output in India, technology from Israel and uh, trade infrastructure from the UAE to accelerate the ability to pull uh, uh, foodstuffs and agricultural output out of India in order to start replacing the kind of the the the, the crisis uh, generated by by the war in Ukraine. And so there's a whole number of kind of international changes, both on the long and the short term, that I think are really giving Israel a greater amount of leverage in that relationship, um, and that I think partly explain the kind of the 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 the, the increased um, assaults, uh, and then. Maybe we can take some 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 questions now. I can see that Prechna is is getting ready to intervene. Yes, um, Sai and Tofik, thank you so much for this um, incredibly illuminating uh, conversation. So I'll just remind our audience that you can post your questions in the chat, um, and if we have time, we'll definitely come to them. Um, 
I had a question for you both on some of the things that you touched upon. So Tofik, you discussed the role um, of the Oslo Accords and how the architecture um, of the Accords frame what is happening today. Um, you also discussed this illusion of the peace process, which helped cloak uh, Israel's um, settler colonialism as it globalized. Um, my question, um, and I'm sure it's one that a lot of people are thinking about at the moment, is what role is the PA playing at this point? Um, how do we grapple with the lack of credibility of the PA today? And where do we see this heading as Palestinian resistance continues and in intensifies across Palestine? Um, I wondered if you could specifically also speak to um, the focus on Palestinians defying their fragmentation across Palestine. So for example, last year's Palestine-wide strike was very inspiring to watch from afar. And I wondered if you could say what the long-term impacts were of that action. So I guess, you know, quickly to answer that, I mean, I think there's a lot been said around the PA in, certainly in English, the general, the English language sort of <laughs> uh, um, the Palestinian Authority was actually a project of Israel and the international community. Okay, it's important to say that. It's a creation of them. It's been funded by them every year. Every time the Palestinian Authority has been in fear of collapsing, the Americans come in and save it, okay? Because they want to save it because they understand to save the PA is the way to save Israel from that Jewish democratic contradiction that I said before. Now, the PA is the frontier where the Palestinian movement formally meets the Israeli settler colonial project formally, okay? Really what it is, is the Fatah movement animating and embodying and dominating this institutional infrastructure and attempting to create a monopolistic, a monopoly over its political and financial uh, uh, inputs. So to be able to preserve its its historical role to preserve itself as a movement, but at the same time not to, how to put this? Uh, not, of course, there, even if there was no PA, there would be a PA, okay? They, the question in the sense that uh, there will always be a frontier, uh, there will always be a frontier where the Palestinian national movement needs to meet the Israelis, okay? The Americans understood that the best way that this could be managed is to try and embolden one section, the least radical section of the Palestinian movement, and to uh, have make the problem of Israel an internal Palestinian problem and trying to displace that into internal Palestinian political conflicts and class conflicts, basically. Fetih does not see itself as needing to confront Israel. It sees itself as needing to hold down the fort, keep a singular Palestinian flag that at least keep the Palestinian project aligned, uh, so, or organized and self-identifying as Palestinians with the main set of rights that it's claiming for the last 70 years, and, and but not to directly confront Israel in any sort of confrontation fashion, particularly one that's mili military, because it understands that the problem is an Israeli problem. Israel has a problem, because the, what, what do I mean by that? Because Israel's problem is not with Fatah or Hamas or whatever. The, Israel's problem is that there are still six or seven million, Palest, million Palestinians between the river and the sea. It's not that because Fatah is corrupt or there's an Islamist, 
Palestinians are too Islamist or radical or socialist or liberal or whatever. Their problem is because that they're not Jews and they're still Palestinians claiming to be Palestinians on Palestinian land and by itself, just by that very primitive objective reality, they can neutralize the Israeli project, the Zionist project, okay? So why confront the Israelis? Fatah's project is basically to keep the Palestinian project alive as, as much as possible. We don't need to fight anybody directly about it. We already paid the price of armed struggle. We got recognition. We got primitive statehood recognitions. And now Europe, America, you figure out your problem with Israel. Okay, you figure out your problem with the seven million Palestinians. You figure out your problem now that Israel is fighting amongst itself because basically the settler co commu the communities of settlers who who are part of that project can't figure out who's going to dominate the state and who gets to milk it most. Basically, that's the problem. You know that because because they use the state of it, this incredible infrastructure that they took over basically and established through the American money and also by overtaking, by taking over Palestine, what Palestine was, call us, they were distributing it amongst themselves basically. And, and there's big fights amongst them as to how, what the identity of that project is and who's gonna get what part of the pie. So Fatah wants to sit back on this, They're, you know, maintain a space where eventually they believe through the numbers, through the problems on the other side, through the problems that could be generated between them and, and the West, that eventually they can make slow incremental gains in a passive manner. So it's a weird thing to say, but that is really what they're trying to do. Now, that is something totally uninspiring. It, it, it has a big part of it is obviously corruption and trying to be monopolistic over the, you know, undemocratic and, and, and dominate the economic and political opportunities of the whole situation. So there's nothing inspirational about it. And in fact, the, the Fatah has all been, been about trying to get rid of anything that's supposedly threatening because they want to keep the address of Palestine alive. Okay, so uh, I'm not trying to be apologetic for them. I'm trying, I need, I think folks in the West need to understand what they are. And they are not the enemy in this situation. Okay, they hold back from a struggle that could be much more. And obviously we want a leadership that's representative, that empowers, that's bottom up, that et cetera. That's not what they are. We do need to understand, but we just need to understand them. So I don't know. So where are they heading? This is an important question. Uh, you know where they're heading. Abu Mazen is 86 years old. The Israelis in the, the Particularly this right wing. I will show you. I'm not going to show you now, but it, I got a thing on my WhatsApp the other day, it, yesterday. Okay, there is this right wing. These dudes, the national religious folks, they want to turn the clock back. They don't even recognize the Palestinians. Okay, they're they're living in another world. Okay, they're ta they're like there's no such thing as Palestinians. The Minister of Interior, what's his name? Smotrich basically went to France and said, there's no such thing as Palestine. It's just a bunch of invention. He, he, he pulls the clock back 50, 60 years when Golda Meir said the exact same thing. They're basically just a bunch of kind of tribes. And the best way to deal with tribes is kind of like, you know, you know, sticks and carrots basically, you know, and give the biggest tribes a bunch of carrots and then have them give them also a bunch of clubs to club the smaller tribes. So the guy, this Likudnik, basically, is basically saying we should establish the the the, the Palestinian Emirates of the West Bank. What he, and he literally went through every single city. He said, in Ramallah, you've got the Tawil family, the Abu Ain family, and the Barghouti family. They're going to be the ones who are running Ramallah. In Nablus, you got these elite. They're, they're t I mean, they're 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 totally in denial of the fact that there's something called Palestinian nationalism, that pa Palestinian national movement, that it's made all these important gains. They want to reverse this clock and establish what was a what was originally a plan known as the Village Leagues. And the Americans tried it also in Iraq with the Sahwa and all this stuff. You basically get you know it's such an Orientalist colonialist mentality. But it's, but it's backwards. So where is it leading today? It's leading today where they're basically, once Abu Mazen goes, because Abu Mazen has, it's, it's too powerful, has too much, is too clever, by the way, 
to, you know, he's not, he's not gonna, he's, he's, he doesn't want to, he, he says all the right things, anti-terror, blah, 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 you know, I just want peace, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, but eventually this guy's gonna go. I mean, because whatever, this will be their opportunity. They consider potentially both to reverse the Oslo Accords and go back to some sort of United Emirates of the Palestinian, uh, you know, and and take over the rest of the land and annex all the lands other than the major cities, okay? And uh, so what they've been doing, by the way, with the Americans, okay, is working carefully because this massive infrastructure that they established through Oslo behind the security thing, 500 checkpoints throughout the West Bank, right? That's this crazy system of levers. You can open and close each city and and blackmail people at 500 different points to, to move a box of tomatoes from one town to another. You can basically blackmail Palestinians around it, you know, and that means you can have the opportunity to, you know, to, 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 to create elites, to make people and break people, right? So, what they're working to do is basically they they don't like that the right particularly doesn't like the idea of a centralized Palestinian project. The Americans and the, and the original Israelis who designed also said no, we need a centralized thing because that way we, we get off our back the the problem of the you know the Palestinians as a problem and we put it put it all on on their plate. And plus, when something like Corona happens, you know. Uh, you know, like it's much easier to deal with one Ministry of Health than 500 villages by yourself through the civil administration, which is the alternative. And they so they prefer not to. So but basically they're aiming to try and cre break up even further, basically the pol unified currently political leadership of the Palestinians because the PA is still an American project, but beneath it is Fetih, and they, they, they don't like the fact that Fetih is clever enough to keep the fort at least alive as a unified project, okay? And that's not giving any political support to it, but it's also saying that it's tactical enough, wise enough not to sort of, you know, it doesn't want to allow the fragmentation of the Palestinian movement the way the Americans and the Israelis want to. So basically, the Americans and the Israelis are trying to set up a situation where between elite families and security elites, they can they can further rule the West Bank by making bilateral deals with the big families in the north, the big families in the south, the big families in the thing, and then when they need to come and clobber whoever doesn't doesn't like that that project, whether it's Gaza or anybody else in the West Bank. So it's so I think that's how folks need to understand the PA. But truth be told, talking to a Western audience like this, I think folks keep that on, you know, keep that inside, kind of understand it in that complicated, contradictory way. But the real focus needs to be on the Israelis and, and the Western support for Israel. And, 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 and you know the abomination of this project that it, that is going on that is promising rivers and tsunamis of blood coming up unless it's unless it's stopped. So, thank you, Tofik. That's really helpful. Um, Tofik, you also spoke about the animation of a national um, religious dynamic within Israel um, over the years, which of course we can see um, manifesting today in the character of the Israeli government. And Sai, you spoke very clearly about um, the intensifying social tensions within Israel, um, taking the form of these so-called pro-democracy protests to uh, protect the Israeli Supreme Court, which of course as we know, and as Mohammed al Kurd covers very clearly in a recent article for The Nation, is a settler serving institution at the end of the day as well. Um, I think you pointed out that, you know, very helpfully that both sides of the divide have a deep commitment to the Zionist movement. Um, so, given that we're not actually seeing a progressive movement whatsoever um, within Israel, um, I have the same question where is this going to go? And more importantly, what do we want to see um, the international solidarity movement rally around? 
Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, where is it going to go? I think is is difficult to, is difficult to answer. I have to say that for quite a long time, I've been very um, skeptical of the fact that anybody in the Israeli political sphere has a serious alternative to, I don't know what we want to call it, Netanyahuism or something. I think he's the only one with a uh, with a consistent political project and a consistent political bloc. Uh, the problem he has is that he doesn't have a big enough majority in Israeli, a, a stable enough majority in Israeli society. So for the last six years, no, the last 2000, end of 2018, so the last three and a bit, uh, I can't count anymore, five and a bit years, there's been six different uh, uh, governments uh, in Israel, uh, all unable to maintain uh, their coalition for long enough uh, to not have to call uh, a a new uh, election. What's happening in that process is that on the one hand, you have Netanyahu and the right and a very stable Likud that is building different alliances around itself. And you have everybody else in what is an increasingly kind of rapidly transforming sea of parties that change their names all the time. The alliances change, who can run with who changes and, and total instability. And I think it points to the fact that nobody has a real alternative to this kind of long-term alliance that the Israeli right has built between, on the one hand, big Israeli capital that has these increasingly kind of international uh, aims, and uh, the settler movement that is keeping the colonial movement uh, effective, expanding, and and active. And that really is the sort of historical block, I think, at, at the center of Israeli politics, that nobody has a very serious alternative to. So will the movement manage to uh, stop the reforms, to alter them, etc.? Perhaps. Uh, I have to say I, I remain unconvinced um, in that it will manage to roll them back entirely. Uh, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong. But I think in the long term, it's very unlikely. Either way, and, you know, like you've said and... and um, uh, um, and, and what I was kind of trying to point to before is that neither of these camps represents either real democracy, i.e. democratic, civil and political rights for everybody that lives in the territory uh, between the river and the sea, um, uh, or a break with the Israeli colonial uh, process. So where can the changes come from? And, you know, I think that the Palestinian left historically talked about... Um, you know the fact that the the transform that the the role of Zionism was its alliance with uh, Western imperialism, and so that the transformation of that needed to be a transformation that would be regional and that would challenge fundamentally the bases of Western imperialism. Actually, I think that hasn't really changed. What does that mean practically? I think practically that means that there are three locuses of resistance. I think one of them we saw, and Tofik talked about it. In the kind of 2011 revolutions, the, the 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 popular movements in the region that have very much been repressed, um, uh, but that fought for kind of democratic, political, economic transformation of the region, which would fundamentally put Israel in a very different position as as it would American imperialism by weakening it. The second one is, of course, or perhaps that's the first one, is the Palestinian struggle for national liberation, and uh, uh, that's not a struggle that's in a position of strength, but it is certainly one that for the last decade has seen really important qualitative transformations. You mentioned the general strike we saw uh, two years ago now and the kind of mobilization across historic Palestine. Uh, the Great March of Return uh, in Gaza a few years back uh, might be another example of that. Uh, the very broad social movements against the Salam Fayyad uh, government uh, around the time of the Arab uh, revolutions. Um, uh, there are other examples. In fact, the, the, the breakdown of the ability of the PA to maintain its kind of dominance, its security dominance uh, in, in the West Bank for the moment and these kind of development of new resistance group we're seeing. All of those, I think, are signs of a collapsing of a particular kind of imposed control from above um, on uh, the Palestinian struggle. And the fact that from below, there are lots of different initiatives that are trying to develop uh, new models, new forms of struggle, 
uh, independent from the kind of uh, Oslo institutions that, that are collapsing all around them. That is not to kind of be, you know, rosy eyed about it and saying that there's a kind of an immediate new uh, uh, solution that will emerge out of them. But I do think they're qualitatively incredibly important and that they point to the kind of new abilities of Palestinians to develop alliances and 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 resistance to Israel's colonial project and that the solidarity movement should do, I think, a much better job in highlighting, building solidarity with, uh, connecting with, having those people speak, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, publishing them, inviting them, etc., etc., etc. And then, you know, the most obvious, but I think it remains true, is that in 2005, 170 Palestinian civil society organizations made a call to the civil societies of the world, demanding that they boycott, divest and sanction governments, institutions and companies that participate in and profit from the continued colonization of Palestine. And people should participate in that, in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, in their universities, in their schools, etc., all institutional links with uh, governments, institutions or companies that participate in or profit from the Israeli colonial project, um, should the, all those links should be broken. That's a difficult struggle. It's one that many people are involved in. And it's one that, you know, I think we should uh, uh, continue and, and intensify. And for us, I think that's the, the most important thing to do, both to increase the pressure from our own governments uh, on Israel, increase the pressure on our own governments to to, to break their, their their links with Israel and to give as much space as possible for the, the movements in the region and in Palestine to to develop uh, in, in opposition um, uh, to Israel's continued colonial project. Thank you, Sai. Um, I think, unfortunately, we'll need to uh, wrap up there. So, Sai and Taufik, thank you so much for this incredibly clear and informative conversation. Um, if our audiences would like to dig a little deeper into some of these subjects that we've discussed today, you can get Sai's book, Settler Colonialism, An Introduction, and Taufik's book, Palestine Limited, New Liberalism and Nationalism in the Occupied Territories. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. Please do subscribe to Haymarket's YouTube channel and stay tuned for more online events. Again, thank you, Sai and Tofik. Thank you so much, Brahma. Pleasure, thank you.